In this industry, you need to be able to handle feedback. You cannot go without it. And you need to be very professional about it because, um, and I've seen little stories where I give people feedback um, that are just students. And uh, so I actually take, so they come to me online. I take the time out of my day to give them feedback and they, ju they just ignore me or they just go against it. And then I'm like. Welcome everyone to V3TD's Fun Render, where we talk about all things rendering. Here today we actually have a special guest who worked on AAA title games such as Forza Horizon 3 and The Division 2. Please welcome our special guest, Emil Sleegers. So Emil, so tell our audience about your journey and what got you here. Oof, you asked me to go back quite a bit in time there. Um, so I, I'm a self-taught artist for the people that don't know. So. Um, well, technically, I did one year of art education, but I never finished it. Um, I started, actually, I started as a programmer way back. Like, I can't even call myself a programmer because I was like 15 or 16 years old. But I did it for like one or two years. And um, then, of course, because you're using Unity in my case, you want to learn how to make games. So from programming, you start to make art. And uh, that's where I found my passion. So when I started doing art, I really liked it, and uh, I started out with like the typical stuff, like make a gun, um, m make some houses, just stuff like that. Um, so throughout my student years, it was mostly improving and improving, and this was high school for me. Yeah, this was pretty much high school for me. Really? And then I finally, because I really liked art and I wanted to get in the game industry, I went to an art school. Um, but what I found out was that after a year, I found out that I uh, sort of already like surpassed what you were supposed to learn in school. It often happens like I, I'm from a very small country where we don't even have a lot of schools. We have like two schools that even do game art. So like there isn't a lot of choice there. <laughs> wow. Um, so in my case, I was like, I, I'm not a big fan of school. I'm not really learning anything. So I started to actually apply for jobs and uh, I think I did like two rounds. The first round I completely failed. So um, like I applied because I didn't know what I was doing. So I just applied with every single company I knew of. Um, and I did like silly stuff. Like I applied for intermediate positions and junior positions and stuff like that. Which of course isn't the smart, most smart thing to do when you're a student. But um, I was very lucky that at the second time um, I actually got a graduate position as an environment artist at um, Playground Games, which is Forza Horizon 3 now. And um, so I basically just went through the process. I did like the recruiting. Uh, I think I was 18 um, at that point. And um, so, yeah, I did come in quite young in the industry compared to most people, <laughs> um, which has pros and cons, I would say. Um, but yeah, so I was 18, I did like the interviews, um, it was in the UK, I'm from the Netherlands myself, so I did have to fly over there and everything. And surprisingly, I still don't understand why they actually gave me the job. <laughs> so, um, and I was, so I, my responsibilities were more like doing actually material art. So, even though I didn't know a lot about it, um, it was mostly material art, a little bit of level art. Um, but yeah, if you look at Forza Horizon 3, 60 70 percent of the road textures that you see are made by me i would say uh, throughout the entire world and all the curbs and all the um what's tra train railings all, all that kind of stuff so that was really cool as like just like a first thing um so we are now already like at age 19 or 20 i believe and it was just a one-year contract so year was up uh, they didn't have a new project yet so unfortunately i had to leave um, wow. So I had to go through the entire process again of starting to apply and luckily enough um, out of like almost all the companies that I applied for one of them got back to me quite quickly which was Ubisoft uh, Reflections which was only four hours away from me uh, up in Newcastle also in the UK and when I applied there I knew that they worked on like Division and they did Far Cry and SS Greed I believe 
but I didn't know what I was going to work on. But um, I definitely played Division before that, so I was really happy that they gave me an ARC test. I did the ARC test and like, what, one or two days later they were like, yeah, sure, you're hired. Or, um, oh no, wait, uh, you get an interview and one or two days after that it was like, you're hired. So uh, going through the entire moving process again, this time up to Newcastle. And I have been there for five years, I believe. So I worked on Division 2. I worked on all of its DLC. So of course, that of, that always takes a lot of time. And I worked on an unannounced project, which unfortunately can't say anything about. Oh, man. <laughs> Come on. All right. Who, who, who lives with that? Yeah, you'll get used to the NDAs when you get into the industry. <laughs> um, then we got to the time that COVID unfortunately happened for, I don't know when you're watching this video. Hopefully it's over by this point, <laughs> if you're watching this. Hopefully, hopefully. We go on hope and pray. Yeah. <laughs> so um, in my case, for me, it was Brexit and COVID. So with all those things, I, des I decided to move back to the Netherlands just to be close to family. And I am currently working um, sort of as like a freelance artist, but also full time as an artist at uh, Flip Normals, which is a very large uh, marketplace and everything. And uh, I'll see where I end up with. So now I'm actually doing also tutorials professionally. So not just like on the site, I'm actually doing it professionally. So um, yeah, so that was like a super quick recap of basically how I got here. <laughs> wow. Well, that's a, that's a very interesting journey. Now, I want to backtrack uh, for a little bit because I know that I have like a lot of like people who are like uh, car enthusiasts who play Forza 3, right? And one of the things they actually asked me is, and this is also people who actually, um, who actually went, who were played the game and actually know somewhat or have an idea about the gaming industry. How were you guys able to actually fit in so many mesh inside that environment um, to actually have like, like uh, without having much stress on the actual game engine itself, and and like and like uh, can you touch based on the licensing? Because I know well enough based off on research, because I know research is a very huge thing when trying to actually create create models, and you want to get the details down down to the to the T as far as like what engine is placed in there, the um, the tires, the struts, the brakes, you know the like like all the details as far as like you need to get like a license from these car brands just to actually have those cars inside of the game. Can you actually just talk a little bit about that so that way our audience can actually get to know about that process? Yeah, sure. So for Forza Horizon, um, at that point we already get into that stage where geometry is less expensive than textures for the people that know about it. Like we got in PS3 no, PS4, sorry, P PS4 um, and the Xbox One and everything. So we are now getting in times where we can push the geometry. Uh, textures are very expensive. So what we had in the game was like with geometry, we were like, eh, just throw, especially cars, because it's the main thing on your screen. So you, it's same as like a character. If you're playing a trip uh, like The Division, that character is probably like 100,000 poses or something like that, compared to the environment could be like a couple more. So... Yeah, we really push the geometry there and just work with textures. As for licensing, so because that is not my department, what I can say is that Playground Games is Playground Games, sorry, is owned by Turn 10, and Turn 10 is um, Microsoft. So they're very big. They made the Forza Motorsport games. Um, so what I assume is they have had relationships with all the car manufacturers for years. Ah. Uh. I don't. I, I honestly don't know. Maybe they paid them a lot of money. Maybe it's free advertisement, um, like stuff like that. When you're a graduate, you do not get included, unfortunately, and stuff like that. Dang. <laughs> well, now, I like uh, there'll be like a want to follow with that because, like, um, because I I know I mentioned about like research materials, and. One of the things that I wanted to mention to students, and I want to get your perspective from this, how important it is to actually have research research materials when actually producing models. Because there'll be times where I actually have students who who want to make a car, but is going to think right off the top of their head and is going to make a car and it doesn't come out where they want it to. And but they actually say, well, it looks great, but there's no research material behind it. 
Can you elaborate to me and, and to our audience why is it important to actually have research material or references to actually make the models look uh, how you envision it to be? Uh, yeah, so I think reference or research material, it's one of the most important things actually in art creation. Even for the most basic stuff, even if you're making a bench, because even though you might, yeah, just like we cannot think of every detail perfectly. Uh, also, especially with cars, they are very detailed. They are like many different um, brands of cars and everything. Of course, you can say like, oh, I know the car, but honestly, um, it doesn't work like that. Like if you, even if you just have like one front facing image, it's not going to work. So I personally, I, when I make projects, I go for hundreds of images just to get every little detail. So it's, yeah, in one point it's, uh, just our brains like we we simply cannot maintain that much detail um, and like remember it so it's very important that we have our reference and everything um, I personally also have like I have had times where I make a material without um, with like just like one reference image that like a low resolution and it looks absolute shit even though I have the skills it looks absolute shit but then I have like um, like one material and like four close-ups and like a big image and everything, and it just looks triple A. So um, I would say it is very very important, like um, more important than your block out, more important than clean geometry even um, in my in my personal uh, what I think at least. So yeah, on honestly. Don't, don't cheat out. Like it's even fun to do. If you're starting a new project, it's fun to go out, find your reference. I personally would recommend, if you can, that you make it yourself with like a good camera, because it's very hard to go to Google Images and find exactly what you are looking for. Because no, no one is gonna go to a bench and go on the bottom and actually make screenshots of the bolts, stuff like that when you're yeah. making a bench. So no one does that. <laughs> so, yeah, like like that. I would say it is very important, and especially if you're a student, like. Um, and I don't mean to sound rude, but uh, students and even professionals, we over, we often uh, think that we are better. Uh, sorry, I don't know the English. Uh, but we think we are better than that we actually are. Like I don't know the actual word for it. Sorry, I. Yeah, we, it's like every artist have their have an ego. So I will say in that regard because I know that we think we are better than what we lead ourselves to be, and then when we actually have like that that moment where it doesn't look very well or if a, if a person looks at your work and say hey it doesn't look very good we take it more personally because we feel that it is it looks like 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 gold but it actually looks like garbage yeah but I, and I want to be very clear about this you need to let that go if you want to get in the industry because it, just think about it I'm a, like when I was a junior I had an intermediate that one has a senior that one has an art lead that one has an art director Every single person gets feedback. Um, in this industry, you need to be able to handle feedback. You cannot go without it. And you need to be very professional about it. Because, um, and I've seen little stories where I give people feedback um, that are just students. And uh, so I actually take, so they come to me online. I take the time out of my day to give them feedback. And they, ju they just ignore me or they just go against it. And then I'm like, do it. Really, really, you shouldn't do that because... Um, even I have like uh, right now I I see environment I think it, it looks cool um, but then for example Corazon um, or um, anyone else um, online they just point something out and then I'm like why didn't I think of that of course that's very logical so um, in that regard it's very important that you learn to get you know, how to receive feedback um, how to process it and also how to respond to it uh, to respond to it in kindness and because those people, they are they are taking time. They are sharing their knowledge to you, and it's very important that you really shouldn't like. There are actual people that if you do that too often enough, you will get on some sort of like a magical blacklist. Not an actual list, but just that people remember you. And I've seen it happen. I've seen it happen where I see a cool portfolio, I send it to my lead, for example, um, and that they say like oh no we don't want to work with this guy because he's really bad at as a personality or he's really bad at teamwork or as getting feedback and uh, that person will not understand why he doesn't get a job for example so that's like extreme cases but i just want to make it super clear how important it is because feedback is everything <laughs> yeah and and i would say like in and like to add on to that like 
as as artists, we should not get in our own way. And and pretty much when we get in our own way, it pretty much hinders us to be more successful in life, not just in professionally, but also personally. Because because I know when I actually have um, some students that actually do have that that big ego, but like when they when you actually have multiple people telling you that it doesn't look very good, you need to fix this, fix that. Um, they don't take it to to heart. But later on in life, like a uh, like I always I'm always an advocate of life is the biggest lesson that for any individual, you know, like eventually it will kick in, you know, but. It probably won't, won't happen right away. Some people may happen right away, but but others it take a little bit longer than most. But um, now going on to the next game, right? I actually had like like uh, you worked on Division Two. Now again, it's the it's the same thing, you know, because for some reason I just think that like uh. Division is a huge game. It's a, it's a huge world, right? And like, a, as like an environment artist, like, a, how long does it take to actually? And even you, if you reference it from Forza too, how long would it take for you guys to actually model just a like a, either a like a, a a low poly car for Division or a high poly car like a high detail model car in Forza? Um. So that one, so that one is tricky. Um, I I know some answers, but because I don't do them myself, uh, don't little take this with a grain of salt. Um, but I've heard that making one car, for example, for Forza, takes like a month. An entire artist takes like an entire full-time month, uh, 40 hours a week or something like, or well, something like that. Uh, sometimes longer. If it is a hero car, then even longer. Um, especially if you think about in Division. Uh, of course, we don't drive cars, but those cars, they're not just like a model. They're a model that doors can open, they can close. There's a lot of setup. It's not just like, oh, here's a model with a texture, be done with it. So even those cars can also take weeks to a month or something like that. So it's not a small thing. So if you're like a student and you think like, okay, I spent a week on a car, just think think about it, think about it how long it takes a AAA artist to do it. And uh, they have experience in it. <laughs> now... Like now, when it comes down to a, an actual car, now have you ever had like an opportunity, well, uh, to actually have like an actual physical car at the studio for artists to actually go in, like dissect it, like take pictures of it, so you actually have those references when you actually build the model like uh, for these games, or, or like a, uh, or you might get like from like a uh, from the manufacturer themselves to actually. It might take pictures of all the ins and outs, or you might go to like a dealership to take pictures of it. Um, what is like, like a, how it is as far as like getting those references for every single like cranny for not only just for cars but also other assets for for in-game engines. Oh, we, we just have like uh, the art team that is responsible for that. That can be environments, that can be materials, it can be cars. Uh, just so you know. Cars are just like characters, they are very dedicated, you have special people for it, because it's way harder to make a car than to make a fire hydrant, for example. Um, but those people, they are, they are, we are big companies, we have connections to like all the manufacturers, so uh, we just call them and we say, can we have a team of people go there and actually just take pictures of the car, and even with like the, like, what was it, uh, the hurricane? Yes. The green, I still don't know Lamborghini, Lamborghini. I don't know which. Yeah, uh, Lamborghini. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, okay. Yeah. So um, with those one, that one just came out. So they, so as far as I know, they actually work together, um, playing on games with them to like promote it. Um, but now I've seen the pictures. I've seen hundreds and hundreds of pictures of the car, and it's it's everything from close-ups and just every single angle you can imagine because that's it's just needed. Okay. It is for everything. Now also. Oh, go ahead, go ahead. I'm sorry. sorry. No, no, that was it. <laughs> okay. So, um, now, dealing with handling the actual, uh, the message that goes into Division 2. Like, because I know that a lot of the models or assets has been used to build this to the actual game engine. Now, on my front, when I was in school, we used Unreal as our platform to actually 
make our assets or put in our assets inside the game engine and pretty much deal with millions of polygons. And I know that that particular, that particular type of game engine cannot handle that many polygons without some, some type of without some type of lag being placed on or strain on that game engine. Now, how would you guys actually go about handling such a huge world, putting all those assets within the game engine without putting too much of a strain on it? Yeah, okay, so there are many techniques that we use. Um, one of the main one is that for very large games, we often we have a dedicated engine. So for example, D Division 2 used a Snowdrop engine. That engine is not, of course, it uses more games, but it is specifically created for games that have a high fidelity of um, assets in a very large open world. Just like that, Forza Horizon uses its own engine that is specifically designed for racing games, where you can go very fast, where it loads everything in very quickly, and things like that. So that's the first one, So and that's like a big one. Like, we spent a lot of money and time um, to make the engines so that we can produce this, and pretty much Almost like every every AAA company uses its own engine. Of course, Unreal is very popular, but I'm talking like big, big guys like EA. Uh, for example, Battlefield has um, uh, Frostbite. Yeah, Frostbite. Yes. Uh, Assassin's Creed has Anvil next. Uh, Division has Snowbe, etc., etc. So you can see that even within Ubisoft, there are multiple en engines that we have for specific games. Um, next to that, we also have some of the classics. Those are things like um, that we use, like of course, optimizing our assets as much as we can. It's uh, <laughs> makes sense. Uh, yeah. It's things like uh, level of detail, and level of detail is very simply: the further an asset is away from the camera, the lower poly it becomes. So if you have something that's a thousand polys when you are just looking at it, of course, it's not a thousand polys when it's a uh, hundred meters away. Then it's maybe like ten, for example, something like that. So it's like so: uh, the further you go away, the lower it becomes. Ah, oh, okay. Uh, yeah. Um, next to that, there are a lot of fancy things uh, that have to do with streaming, um, which is more on the technical side, so uh, I, I cannot say too much about it. Um, but literally in open world games, you structure your environment in a way that the streamer, so, the, uh, so loading an asset is called a streamer pretty much. Um, I hope I said it correctly. Yeah, 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 um, right. But streaming assets in, that's very important. So we design our level around it. For example, this is also, and this is, where, this is pretty much every single game, you can literally see it. If you have a game that all of a sudden has a lot of assets and a lot of stuff going on, um, you will notice that often the areas around that game or the areas that you are not looking at often, they have almost nothing in it or a lot less assets. This is simply because we know pretty much what uh, most people are going to look at we, w when they run through a game. We do not expect them... Um, to like really go in all the back alleys and we really like look at everything in utmost detail. So we also play upon that. Um, even even in Forza, because we understand that you go very fast in Forza, um, we can play around with the level of detail using those techniques. Oh. Um, so it's, and I, I'm saying this very easy, but remember we are, I'm talking about 100, 200, 300 people that need to take this into account, that need to work all together in sync. So it's not, like one person and that's also why unreal engine is really good but it's made for the masses it's made for every single person to use in their own way you can make everything from racing games to first person shooters it doesn't matter hmm. but it does mean that things are less dedicated um unless they roll out their update that can handle a billion polies or something like that with mega scans that i've seen but <laughs> next to this yeah yeah it's a very difficult thing to explain and um i'm also spreading the needle here because there's a lot of stuff that I'm not allowed to say so I'm really thinking about like stuff because I cannot give out uh, techniques that we use and like unless they are very mainstream stuff like that understandable now um, now as far as like like every artist had gone through this at certain point in time no matter what kind of project it actually did now what are the hurdles that you had to face when actually working on any of these titles, no matter if it's like Division um, 2 or Forza or even personal projects, what kind of hurdles that you actually face and how did you actually overcome them? Um, ooh, that's a tricky one. So, 
one of the things and um, a little secret in the game industry because everyone is always complaining about the trailers being downgraded and everything um, the reason for that is again optimization we make we make the game first in and now of course i can talk for every company but most companies we first make the game uh, looking at it as best as we can then we get to a point where we need to get it back into budget so that it can run on every single console because we are not making it just for pc we need to target lower end pcs higher end pcs ps4 doesn't matter um, so because of that you have to of course sometimes if it's very expensive take out textures you need to take out models or um, at least like lower them down and that's what you can see with the classic oh this game has been downgraded it's not like we can do it it's just that you guys want to be able to play the game i assume at 30 fps you don't want to play it at 15 fps um, so a hardware is a bottleneck that's why the film industry can go so much higher because they don't care about hardware they render it out once and they're done um, so yeah so because of that that was one of my challenges that in the beginning like i, I can make really really awesome art and super super detailed um, but then after a while i need to i need to find ways to make it fall into budget and uh -huh. i worked on, like on division i've made assets that i use 30 40 000 times in the world um so it's not like so literally then at that point because it's used everywhere uh every poly counts pretty much and every texture counts and that was the struggle for me getting something to look very good but still having it work and that's why it's so nice that now in the game industry that we get better hardware so we can like lower like we can go easy on the poly count textures are still very important but like i don't need to worry anymore about merging a single vertice together let me say it like that unless i work on like a vr game or a mobile game um but yeah it is a struggle <laughs> now like uh w one thing that i learned when uh when when i was in school when actually building like uh models now i don't know if you actually use this technique or not but we was told that like uh when we were trying to actually lower the actual size of a mesh and like uh, especially doing with high poly ones like we actually had to create now would it be a good idea to actually take like uh to reduce the amount of poly count in there if it, if you can be if it's seen within the actual asset keep it if it cannot be seen get rid of it would that be like yeah. an actual technique that students can use within their their project or their work um yeah it is sorry so yeah that's something that you will learn very early on it after a while it just becomes um like you do it without even thinking about it because it makes sense like if you cannot see it you just get rid of it the only time where you need to pay attention to this is if you make generic props which means props that are being used in many different ways and this could be like uh for the vision i made like a lot of debris and everything so i know that those props they can be scaled up down rotated everything so in those cases you need to make sure that you don't all of a sudden have a missing face because an artist uses it in a slightly different way than you expected. Uh, but yeah, for the rest, get, get rid of it. Uh, get rid of bottom faces if, you, if they are sunk into the ground and stuff like that. Um, it's, it's wasted geometry, so... <laughs> okay. Now, um, with that being said, right, because like, I know I have like, like a... Um, I want to talk about like like what you do outside of work. So pretty much, I know that working on projects does get like a little bit like uh, um, hectic from time to time. And you want to have a, that reset. Were there any kind of hobbies that you do that like, keep your mind away from from 3D or to help you reinvigorate or re-energize you as far as get you motivated to do another 3D project? Um, so in my case, I don't have a lot of free time because. Uh, yeah, I, I work a lot. I make tutorials next to it. Um, I, I do do photography, um, although I often link my photography back to 3D because for me, uh, 3D is my hobby. So like when, when I'm when I'm doing it, I don't often feel like I'm working, um, even if I'm just practicing. Like I, I'm actually having fun doing it. So for me, my free time and I'm, yeah, my free time is for me. It's like the basic stuff. Like I, I really love movies. So I have like a projector and like a little home cinema. So that's like my free time. Uh, I like to do photography. Now I try to link it by when I go to nice places, also immediately just take reference images because just like we spoke in the beginning, it's very important. Um, so I do that kind of stuff. 
and uh, for the rest, um, like I, I am kind of person that does like weird random investments, uh, stuff like buying a house, fixing it up, and selling it again uh, when I have time. So it it is big stuff layer, but I only do that like uh, once once a year, once every two years, or something like that, or like I start some random website. Um, so I like to do that kind of stuff, but almost everything is linked to digital for me. I'm a very digital person. Um, yeah, that, that's just what I like. Some people like to go out and uh, get drunk or something like that, but I rather make art, stuff like that. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm all about digital, so I, I definitely understand where you're coming from in that part. No matter if it's like dealing with like uh, coming with, with like different brands or packaging or posters, flyers, any kind of promotional items that, that comes into to play. Even dab a little bit of 3D every now and then to to, to uh, dust off the uh, uh, the 3D skills, so this will, to to invigorate me a little bit. But with that being said, like we're about to come to a close. But my last question for you, like uh, that, like uh, I gotta ask all my guests, what is your key victory? No matter is it professionally or personally. So what is your key victory? Um, in what way do you mean that? Um, so, do you mean uh, a key achievement that I've done, or how it, do you mean it? Well, it could be either an achievement that you actually got, or an accomplishment you actually made in life. You know, what be like a victory for you as far as like anything? Like it could be like a personal or professional. Um, for me, it it, it was simply getting into the game industry, because um, so. I well, for me the decision to get to go in the game industry was was playing a game which was called The Last of Us. I'm sure many people know it. Yes. Um, so I saw that game. I saw the amazing art, and that was for me the time that I said, "Okay, cut the crap. I'm really gonna really set my foot on it, and I'm really going to work hard to get in the game industry." And for us, uh, so far, that's still the biggest victory. Maybe because I was so young, so I found that an achievement being able to do it at quite a young age. Uh, it was a bit weird because I'm literally working with people that could be my father at that point. But <laughs> but uh, nah, de definitely just getting the getting the job in the game industry, um, and after that it becomes working on the projects. So um, I'm working on Forza, working on the division. There are such massive projects that is something that you don't forget in your life. Like uh, you, yeah, you worked on something big, millions of people play it, and that's just so so awesome. And uh, that's very important to me, and that's why I love to do it also. Okay. So, well, everybody, that is it for our latest episode on, on Victory 3D, where we do all things rendering. Thank you, Emil, for joining us here today. And like I said before, everybody, make sure you tune in next time. We actually have another podcast with another artist where we do all things rendering. Thank you, Emil. Yeah, thanks. <laughs>